Hello, everybody, and thanks for stopping by. We've got a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right into it, not waste time. So first of all, I put a tweet this morning, and I can just tell you right now that I am not a geopolitical expert. I don't know anything uh, remotely that, that is going on with this war and the uh, story and the backstories behind it. So I'm not even going to pretend to say that I do or try to explain things uh, at a very high level. This is the information I have, and this is what we're moving going forward. And I sent out this tweet this morning. I said this. You just remember that we can't control the events that happen. The only thing that we can control is our reaction to them. I want you to remember that as we move forward for all this information. And um, again, like all this, this stuff is happening so fast. So of course you can find a lot of information on uh, Twitter, but this just happened a couple of hours ago. This is from Mario Nafel. And of course he's the one that does all the different Twitter spaces and it says, he says confirmed Hamas is open for a truce discussion already. Musa Ab Abu Mazoktor al Jazeer Hamas has achieved its targets. Asked if they were willing to discuss a possible ceasefire. Said it was open to something of the sort and all political dialogues. That's what's going on in the world. Again, I'm not going to get into it because this, that's not my, my area. But what I want to do is I want to take a look at, and again, control the things that we can control and take a look at historically how things have gone for wars and traditional markets, as well as Bitcoin and the crypto market. So there was a really good interview uh, this morning with uh, Mohamed el -Rin. He is uh, Alliance and Gramercy advisor. He's also at Cambridge College, I believe, and uh, he's the chief economist there at CNBC. And uh, they asked him the question, like, how is this going to uh, affect the markets moving forward right now? So he's going to give a pretty good piece of information, just take a listen. This is only like a, a minute long. It's seven minutes. I link in the description. You can check it out. But uh, let me make sure you can actually hear what he is talking about. And uh, just take a listen here. Thoughts and prayers with the families and friends of those who lost loved ones and all the other innocent people who are either missing um, or have been taken hostage. Look, this makes the U.S. outlook even more difficult. I think the key question, and you've got some really good guests coming up, is, is this conflict contained or does it bring in other parties? So far, the markets are trading as if it's contained. Um, but if this expands and brings in other parties, then the outlook is for even a weaker global economy, even more inflationary pressures, and, and the markets are going to be, be finding it hard to deal with that. So yeah, and you can see it right there. Let me bring this back up. Because this was in the very early morning. I think this was pre, before the markets actually opened up. And of course, everybody's going to talk about the same thing. Here comes World War III. This is the worst thing of all time. And this is just awful. And again, I mean, I'm not saying that it can't be or it could be or it will be. I'm just saying this is what the information that we have. And of course, when he said that, it's all priced in or people are, the markets are treating it like uh, this is contained. When we take a look at it in general, I mean... Over the last, over the course of today, right now it is uh, 5.30, markets are closed, I believe, in New York. And we can see that over today. I mean, it started off kind of rocky, but then off we go. How do we look over five days? Pretty good. How about one month? How about six months? How about a year? And of course, how about max? I mean, overall, the markets themselves look like it was no big deal, even though we talk about these things about the worst thing. And then of course, our markets, eh, took a little bit of a drop. And I am actually, this is not going to sound right, but it, but it is right. I'm glad that we are trying to finally get a little bit uncorrelated. Now, we talked about this a couple of days ago when we had, uh, it was a Dan Moorhead uh, interview from Pantera Capital. And he even said, he goes, crypto, Bitcoin and crypto markets are becoming uncorrelated, and that is very good. And we can see right here that today was a pretty great day for S&P 500. However, for Bitcoin, the rest of uh, the altcoin market, it looks pretty red and going down. So the question then becomes, if this starts to go out of control, and if we see different players jump in in different countries and it becomes a, a bigger thing, how does this affect us in the markets? Again, I feel terrible for what's going on over there. I can't control that. I can only control the things in my sphere. So I need to take a look at how different wars have affected the markets themselves. And this is from Science Direct. And it talks about on February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. Remember that? It wasn't too long ago. And I remember when that happened, what did we say? World War III is coming. This is awful. This is the beginning of the end. It's like that for every single war just about. I'm not saying <laughs> the end isn't near. I'm just saying that's what we say every single time. So this is February 24th. We can see here 
the markets. This is the NASDAQ, S&P 500, MSCI World, and stock 600 Europe. And we can see that in the very first day, there was actually a little bit of an uptick because no one really believed it. And they're like, is that really true? That was the 25th. Then the 28th came around, then February 1st. And we can just see, or excuse me, March 1st. And we can just see that things started to, to decline quite rapidly. And then, of course, the market says, oh, okay, this is what it is. It's not too bad. And it kind of rallied. And it starts here at the end of March. So when I look at this, I'm like, well, that looks pretty good, but that's March 2022, right? So if we take a look at the S&P 500, let me, let me bring this together so you can see it better. When we're talking about the S&P 500 and we're talking about the historical trends and what happened, let's bring this together. So if we're looking at March of 2022, that's right here. And that's where they stopped. And it looked cool, right? It's like, oh, that's not too bad. But then it just started to just collapse and collapse and collapse. And I thought to myself, well, was this something that had to do with the actual war itself? Yeah, it could be. But also remember during that time, what did we see? Well, we saw Gary, excuse me, <coughs> Jerome Powell. I always want to say Gary Gensler as if he's like the number one evil person of all time. But it was Jerome Powell, who's not evil. I think he's doing the best job that he could possibly can. But what did they started to do around this time? They started to raise rates. And as the rates went up, everybody in the market, of course, they were saying, he's not going to do it. He's not going to raise. And he raised again. He won't do it this time. And he did it again and again and again and again and again. And of course, now we are settled out. Hopefully they can get this magical 2%. I don't think they're going to get it for quite some time, but we'll see. So, but then we took a look at that. And then I thought to myself, well, how do wars in general affect all markets? And going back to the big war in World War II. Actually, let's just start up here. So if we take a look at the S&P 500 index, Saudi Aramco drone strike. The Iranian general killed. I don't have any, anything for that on this one so yet. That's in 2020. For some reason, this was not updated. But the drone strike in 2019, North Korea missile crisis. The total drawdown was negative 1.5, negative 4%. The bottom took 14 to 19 days. Time to recover, 36 and 41. I'm not going to go through all these things, but if you're old like me, you remember most of these things. U.S. terrorist attacks, 2001, Iraq's invasion of Korea, of Kuwait, 1990, Reagan shooting, 81, Yom Kippur War, 1973. And that was the one that was roughly 50 years ago, which is what happened now today, 50 years in one day. Negative 0.3, negative 0.3, the bottom was a day, two days, nothing. But this is the thing. Pearl Harbor, World War II, because that's what everybody says, right? It's going to be World War III. How bad was this in the markets themselves? Well, that was on December 7th, 1941. World War II ended in roughly September 1st, September 2nd, 1945. That was when victory was declared. So it went down at this time frame. At the bottom, it was a 20% drop. 20% drop in S&P 500 for the greatest war we've ever been in. World War II, 20%. The time that it took for the bottom was 143 days. So it took 143 days at the bottom and it took less than a year to recover. And that was in World War II, World War II. So if we take a look back here, what would that look like? Let's blow this up again. So if we take a look over here, 1941, right? Somewhere around here. And we just crate it out. And then in 1942 is when we bottomed. And look what happens, 1943, and then we come up here. And coincidentally, what I find quite Interesting about this piece, let me blow this up so you can see it. Oh. We rallied into a recession. Of course, this is the Great War. We rallied into the recession. We had a recession. The market said, we know what's coming. And we kept going up and up and up and up. Now we kind of, you know, took a bit of a, of a dip and dropped down. But that was a, a massive, massive event. And that's how bad it got, less than a year moving forward. And then of course, I don't, I mean, take it for what you will. And this is not something that I'm bragging about, I'm just telling you, I can only tell you the information that kind of ease some nerves. Stock markets are less volatile when, when the US is at war, but we're always at war, it seems like. Didn't stop us for Iraq or Afghanistan, 20 year war and left everything over there. That's a rant I'm not gonna get into. And then markets at war, you can see the full history, 1926 to 2013, up into 2013. The return for large cap stocks, 10, 11.6%. For small cap, long-term bonds, 5.6, 5.3, and so on and so forth, even in the Gulf War. Of course, the risk is a little bit elevated. So 
that is it in a nutshell as far as war, markets, and Bitcoin. Because I know when people hear about it, it's very sensationalistic when you see World War III, everything's coming to an end, this is worse, fire emojis, blah, blah, blah. But historically, this is what we have. And of course, I pray that peace and cooler heads prevail, but we'll see. Let me just think about that in the comment section. And then also, as a quick reminder, that uh, I know some people, I mean, even myself, I get a little bearish. I mean, hey, I'm human. I see some of the negativity that's going around. But I got to tell you, as far as the miners go, they have no problems being bullish. And of course, Bitcoin hash rate hit its all-time high yet again. So here we are, October. I think it starts at October 8th, Sunday. Yeah, October 7th. So we've hit a hash rate all the way up to the very the top of what we can produce and all the different mining operations and mining rigs are going full tilt. You know how much money that is for electricity and then to upgrade all those rigs? I think they know what's coming. And I think that when we see a bull market, whenever that is, 2024, 2025, 26, I don't know what it is. I don't have a crystal ball. But when that happens, some big money is betting big on this market and I can kind of feel where things are going. But again, nobody has a crystal ball. I'm just saying it's not all bad. Things will be fine. Time in the market, greater than timing. So that's it for that piece. Let me just think about that in the comments section. And now we talked a good amount about uh, Bitcoin and wars. And I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. So don't hate on me, but we're going to talk about altcoins. So everybody just, just calm down. There's some good things going on out there, not just Bitcoin. There's some altcoins that are doing great. For, for transparency, I'm biased. Everything I'm going to talk about, I own. I own Bitcoin. I'm going to talk about Cardano. I'm going to talk about Solana. I do not hold Internet Computer Protocol, but there was something very interesting that guy showed me from Coin Bureau. So let's just jump into this, shall we? First things first, congratulations to World Mobile Token. They launched their first Aerostat. It's, uh, that's that blimp behind Mickey Watkins right there. And he was uh, live on CNBC Africa. This is a minute and a half clip. And I want to say congratulations. And I can tell you that there are some parallels between what is Mickey is saying and what Uber did back in the early 2000s. So let me just listen to this, this video real quick. Let me see, make sure that you can actually hear this. About a minute and a half. Take a listen. Your experience operating this kind of, uh, the kind of model you're operating in Zanzibar. Zanzibar, we wanted to unleash the entire sharing economy. So our network, our dynamic network, is made up of two different uh, types of assets. Ground, so terrestrial assets, and ones that fly or, uh, fly or flow, floats. Uh, so in combination, we wanted to use Zanzibar as the perfect testing ground to show that this could work. And you have this ubiquitous huge coverage, maybe one or two aerostats covering the whole of the islands around Zanzibar. Uh, as well as the ground network taking the capacity so that we could cater for the million people on the ground there. Unfortunately, and we're still waiting for Zanzibar to give us permission to launch, but whenever they do, we're ready. But Mozambique, on the other hand, uh, the regulator has been incredible, uh, and so has the, the flight authorities and everybody involved in the whole process. So in Zanzibar, we wish to show this, but uh, we waited 11 months, and we're very happy that Mozambique was next on our list. And we have uh, another seven or eight different African countries and Middle Eastern countries who are also waiting to, to deploy these aerostats to see what they can do and if they truly are 12 times less in coverage. Because if it is uh, that much cost difference, this can change the entire world and the entire uh, way that we connect rural areas. And finally, it can be profitable, which means ultimately the end user, the person on the grounds with their handset, has affordable cheap connectivity to take opportunities into their own hands. And I'm not yes. So, again, hats off to Mickey and the whole World Mobile <laughs> WMT Wobble Wobble World Mobile Token, as they did what they said they were going to do, which is actually launch and make things incredibly cheap for telecommunications and giving the unconnected connectability. And uh, this was, and of course, in Mozambique, it launched. And this is uh, a picture from the balloon itself, or the, excuse me, the aerostat. I don't know who took that, that uh, picture above the aerostat, but uh, pretty amazing that they actually launched it and got it off the ground, which is they're doing 99% better than most of the tokens out there, or coins, uh, that say they're going to do something. Don't do it. These guys actually did it. 
And what he was talking about, well, he talks about this is going to be less expensive. This is going to be able to get everybody accessibility. When I was listening to this, I watched this Netflix docudrama last night. It's a season. It's uh, over like four or five different uh, episodes. And it takes a look at Uber and what they had to go through to actually make Uber a real thing. And I want everybody to watch this when they have time. If you have Netflix, I'm sure you have Netflix, you're probably stealing the username and password from your uh, from, from significant others or whoever else you're stealing it from. Just kidding. I'm sure we all pay for Netflix. But watch this, this series and tell me if this isn't the same thing that's going on with Bitcoin, with all digital assets, as these guys got railroaded and rammed down because they were trying to change the status quo. And we talks about, and you're gonna hear this term a lot, stickiness and how easier it is, how cheaper it is, and how much better it is compared to the age old adage of the taxis back then and what it would be like if they didn't do what they had to do. Take a listen to that and tell me if it's not the same thing that's going on with World Mobile Token and everything else that's out there. Anyhow, what do you think about that in the comment section? And also, some more good news. I know we get bombarded with bad news, so I try to give a little balance. And uh, some days when there's more bad, I give you more good. Some days when there's more good, I give you more bad, quite honestly. But this is from my, my guy, Classy Games. And he says, uh, Star Atlas. This is a AAA rated game that's uh, pretty much ready to come out pretty soon. Uh, there's, some, there's some beta testers and people playing it right now. Star Atlas, I didn't know this. It's, well, first of all, I knew it was built on Solana. And it was using Solana as their platform but they are 15% of all Solana transactions globally, 15%. When I talk about Web3 gaming, because it actually has utility and people have to use it, I'm not lying. This is serious. This is, I think, is gonna be the future, which is Web3 game. Now, I could be wrong. I've been wrong on many, many things moving forward, but I wanna say thank, thank Classy for finding this. And I was like, is this true? Because this is just some tweets. Well, I want you to go out and you can uh, verify this. There's analytics.soulscan.io forward slash overview. I linked in the description because you're not going to remember, but that's okay. Uh, just go over there and you can find a bunch of information on Solana, uh, transactions per second. And I find this very weird. Transactions per second and success rate. Uh, TPS 4,523 transactions per second. It's pretty good, but the success rate is 98.85. I need to dig into that. That doesn't sound right, but I'm just maybe not looking at it correctly. It doesn't matter. This is what I want you to verify. Here's the, there's between the vote transaction and the non-vote transaction. Vote transaction is just you, it's just people being on the actual chain and voting for whatever else it is. And it, of course it pumps up the numbers, but non-vote transactions, people actually interacting with the chain, making purchases, moving things around, not votes. That's uh, far, far less, and that's what we we're looking at. That's 16,435,678. And of course, over here, the Sage, and of course, Sage Labs is responsible for uh, Star Atlas. And they're doing 2.2 million transactions. That's 15%. So again, I think this is pretty great. Speaking also of Solana, oh, here's another one if you want to take a look. That's the block, but same thing. Speaking of another thing of Solana, uh, Solana and Bitcoin are neck and neck for institutions buying. I don't know if you knew this, but we had covered this a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was even last week, I forget. But Solana investment products see the largest week of inflow since March, 2022. I thought this was a repeat until I saw the date, October 9th, 2023. So this is correct. Here's what we got. Digital asset investment products, uh, asset managers such as CoinShares, Grayscale, 21 shares, Bitwise, and ProShares recorded inflows for the second consecutive week, both since July, adding 78 million, led by Solana and Bitcoin funds. Interesting. Salon investment products, products returned their largest inflows since March 2022, adding 24 million. So uh, Solana put in 24 million out of 78 million. And of course, Bitcoin did much more, but still, Solana is a nice close second. Bitcoin dominated the overall inflows, adding 43 million. However, some investors did capitalize on recent price strength, began adding to short Bitcoin product positions, but that's only 1.2 million. So again, uh, well, obviously, I own Solana because so, I'm talking about it. But uh, I think it's a pretty good thing for Solana to have a uh, second straight week of inflows from institutions buying, it, buying itself out. Now then, this is something I don't own, but I thought it was very interesting. And maybe at some point I will buy it. I'm not for sure. 
Internet Computer Protocol, ICP, which I always thought was insane clown posse, but apparently not. There was this great video from Guy over at Coin Bureau, and he talked about his 10 uh, tools that he used over there over that Coin Bureau. And one of those was CryptoMiso.com. Again, links in the description. It's a free website, and what it is, it's, it's GitHub commit history of 218 cryptocurrencies based on the most popular repository, which is GitHub. So this is where the developers are going, right? Now, I'm not a developer. I've never used GitHub. I'm sure there's a way around this. But apparently, this is like a rough estimate of what developers are actually doing. So if we take a look at crypto commits for the past 12 months, and this is 280, 218 cryptos, not all of them, I will remind you. But ICP is number one. Sushi Swap, close second, 4,500. Mina, I don't know what that is. Solana, 33, wait, Pancake Swap, 27. Mass, 2597. Chainlink, which is huge and popping off, 2400. Rubik, Bitcoin BEP2, and Cosmos. And shame, Bitcoin's number 11. No, I'm just kidding. Bitcoin's just fine. Whoa, Bitcoin Cash, eCash, I don't know. Bitcoin Cash ABC, that's ridiculous, but okay. Now that's 12 months, but Rob, what about the past three months? We don't care about the last year. All right, past three months. Well, ICP is number one. Mean is number two. Chainlink is number three. Solana is number four. Pancake Swap, Sushi Swap, Mass Network, bip, bop, 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 bop. all that great stuff. However, I will tell you, take it with a grain of salt because when I was taking a look for Cardano, it's not there. So don't just dismiss it because your favorite crypto project is not on there. They got a ton, but I just found it very interesting. Let me know what you think about that. And then I will say this, ICP, Every time I do a video, someone asks me about ICP. So I'm like, okay. But when I saw that on the repository, I'm like, that's pretty interesting. That means the people are working on it. It's not a dead chain. And maybe it's got something to it. And I had to take a look at it, what it actually was. Actually, I'm not even going to try to. We'll go to the uses, the token itself. First of all, it's a governance token. First, there's a governance token. It can be staked to exercise those governance rights. Nobody that's fine if you want to keep voting and won't do anything with it. But as a utility token, it can be burned to obtain cycles, which serve as gas for computation and storage and canister smart contracts. It can also be minted to reward node machine providers for providing computational and storage. So like AWS, I guess, for computational storage. I'm not for sure. But again, looks quite interesting. And that got me thinking, if it's so damn good, well, what if I would have added that to my dollar cost average? How would I have done? So I, I added this to my dollar cost average scheme, which I'm using Ben's site. You can pick it up. This part's free. The DCA I'm always using, but uh, for the more advanced stuff, it costs, but uh, you get 10% off with the link in the description. And I took, a, I, and I added uh, ICP to the things that I have dollar cost averaging presently. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, Dogecoin, blah, 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 blah. And I wanted to see how well it would do. And it didn't come out. And I was looking at it, I'm like, okay, this is, let me blow this up. This is 2020, it's not there. 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020. ICP isn't there yet. Where the heck is it? And I thought at first, I'm like, man, Ben's site's not working. But then here it is. You know that ICE Internet Computer Protocol didn't come out until May of 2021? May of 2021. So if I would have put 10 bucks a week, that's all I'm doing in this one, 10 bucks a week, I would be down what? 98%. All right, let's go forward. Uh, on August 30th, I'd be down 82%. On uh, January 3rd, 2020, I'd be down 82 Let's just go to the end. ICP is down 76%. Arbitrum is down 90%. That's pretty bad. But ICP is the second, it's the, it's the first loser, or the second loser. Why? So I had to take a look at the price action for ICP on CoinGecko. And over 24 hours, I mean, you know, everything has done that. How about seven days? How about 14 days? How about 30 days? How about 90 days? How about 180 days? How about a year? What the heck is going on with this, with this project? Oh, this is what it was. It launched in 2021 and started out at 461 bucks in the mania that was the bull market of 2021. Remember those days? Oh, great days. And then it just fell off a cliff. And of course, when I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, no wonder people think it sucks because there's no price action. Sometimes we think that price action means that a project sucks, but not all the time. 
I'm reserving judgment. I'll do more research. But it did look fairly interesting that so many people are working on it when it is a dead chain. So we will see about that one. And then lastly, before we get into Q&A, as a reminder, uh, October 14th, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, the cutoff's October 3rd. I'm giving away uh, two, 100,000 sweat coins. Uh, and that'll be on October 14th. I'm giving away to 20 people. 5,000, yeah, I had to do some quick math. 5,000 per, per winner, I'm giving away to 20 people. Also, I'm giving away uh, sweat uh, NFTs, which are rare and epic. And I'll be doing that for free on October 14th. All you gotta do is uh, follow me on uh, Twitter and just follow News Assets, Sweat Economy, comment, retweet, and enter to win this thing right here in type form. And of course, that also, link in the description. And that is it for today. Man, that was a lot of stuff. So look, I know there's a lot of information. There's a lot of things going on right now, and I think it's important that uh, we just keep abreast of the situation of what's going on. I know there's a lot of negativity, but remember, there's only so many things you can control. Deal with the things you control and with the outside, outside. And that's it.